As debate heats up over election redistricting in North Carolina, one term that will crop up is county clusters. Joining us to make sense of the term is Dr. Andy Jackson. He is director of the Civitas Center for Public Integrity at the John Locke Foundation. And Andy, you recently wrote a research brief about this. And we're not going to get into all of the details because there's a, a lot of information there. But first of all, just what is a county cluster and why is it important to redistricting? Well, a county cluster is a grouping of counties uh, that match up with an ideal population or within an ideal population range. Under North Carolina law, especially under a court case, Stevenson versus Bartlett, which came up about two decades ago, uh, you have to have groups of counties that correspond with an ideal population of a set number of districts. It sounds complicated, uh, probably is complicated, but for example, if you have a county that has about 82,000 people, they get their own house district by themselves. If they're a little more, a little less, they have to be grouped with another county so that they can form one, two, three, or more uh, districts within that grouping. And the reason for this is twofold, isn't it? Part of it is a constitutional requirement dealing with splitting of counties, mm -hmm. and the other one is the requirement that these districts all have to be about the same size. Right. Um, North Carolina has both of those clauses in its constitution, and they are basically incompatible with each other uh, because you have little counties like Terrell County out in the east that are well under the minimum requirement to have a district wholly contained within the county. Then you get large counties like Mecklenburg or Wake who have huge populations that could hold multiple counties. And so the old idea that we had back into the 19th century of having each county represented uh, individually individually in the General Assembly just doesn't work anymore and it hasn't worked for a while. This is a way to try to reconcile those two different aspects of the Constitution. Your research brief goes into quite a bit of detail about how you might draw a cluster and draw mm -hmm. some districts within a cluster. Uh, it's going to be difficult for us to, to get into that level of detail, but why is this an important concept for people to know if they're thinking about redistricting? It's important to know because it puts some very serious constraints on what legislators can and can't do when they're drawing districts. Um, if you look at some of the state legislative districts that were drawn before the Stevenson versus Bartlett case, there were they would kind of have these little tendrils going out in every different direction. They'd grab some part of one county, combine it with another county, and then go into a third county on a thin, narrow line. Uh, this put an end to that. Uh, so there are limits on how creative legislators can be uh, when they're drawing districts because they have to respect those county lines. Now, in this case, I imagine a lot of folks who are interested in good government would say the absence of creativity or limiting the amount of creativity is probably a good thing. Yeah, it is. It is. And this is certainly the case in the more rural districts where, you know, a lot of the districts are kind of going to be prescribed by the county clusters. There are some of these groupings where you'll have like, a couple of counties that will fit within a single district. There's nothing legislators can do about that. It's basically math as dictated through the Stevenson case. Uh, there are other cases, particularly in the larger counties, where you're doing 13 counties in uh, Wake County, for example. 13 or, districts. Sorry, sorry, 13 districts. Or you have 13 districts that are combined in, um, in Mecklenburg County. There's different ways you can draw that, obviously, within the county. But we also have to deal with compactness issues, trying to keep as much as you can uh, cities together. And so all of those things together, along with the restrictions about not crossing county lines, do limit what legislators can do. You made a point in the research brief that I thought was interesting and important to note, and that is knowing this clustering process can help tell people why, uh, for example, Durham County must share a North Carolina House district with Person County, but is barred from sharing House districts with any other counties. Uh, without having to get into the details of, of Durham County, is this something that plays out across the state in other ways that some people might think, oh, I'd rather have a district that has these two counties together, but the, the math won't permit it? Exactly. And this happens all over the state. I'll maybe give you perhaps the best example is 
uh, Edgecombe County and Nash County. They they basically split the city of Rocky Mountain half uh, because of the math, because of the way you add up those districts. There's no way you could combine Edgecombe County and Nash County into a single district. It just doesn't work with the math and, and fulfilling the constitutional requirements of the whole county uh, provision and keeping populations equal. And so there's going to that kind of thing is going to play out across the state where there are people that would rather be grouped with a county across the line, but they can't do it. It's just not allowed. Are there possibilities for different types of clusters across the state, or are the clusters pretty much determined by the, the numbers that are in the census? Uh, well, they're determined by the census. North Carolina is, strict, is one of the states that follows that, not constitutionally, but by statute. Uh, North Carolina is following the numbers as dictated by the census. And so in most instances, these clusters, these collections of counties, these groupings, are, are essentially predetermined before legislators even look at it. It's just the way the math adds up uh, with the population of the counties. There, there are a few exceptions on both the House and the Senate map where you could have different configurations of county clusters that would be legal uh, under the Stevenson case. Uh, but for most counties, we already know, even before legislators look at it, which county groupings or clusters they're going to be in. Looking at this uh, on the whole, as an advocate of good government and having this process work as effectively as possible, do the clusters and the rules that force legislators to use the clusters, in your judgment, is that a good thing for this redistricting process, having these types of rules that constrain the legislators? I, I think it's a good thing. Uh, is it the ideal way to do it? Perhaps there, there are other ways you could try to do this, but it's certainly better than what we had before the Stevenson case uh, in 2002, where you could just, legislators felt free to just divide up the counties any which way they wanted to in order to further their advantage. Um, there may be better ways to try to minimize the division of counties without relying on the county cluster method, but so far at least this method has worked well to restrain legislators. If you'd like to learn much more about this issue, including seeing some examples of how the clustering works, you'll want to go to the John Locke Foundation's website and find the research brief with the headline, What County Clusters Mean for North Carolina's Redistricting Process. Its author is Dr. Andy Jackson. He is director of the Civitas Center for Public Integrity at the John Locke Foundation. Thanks so much. Thank you.